Hello and welcome to the Your Financial Pharmacist Real Estate Investing Podcast, a show all about empowering pharmacists to achieve financial freedom through real estate investing. I'm Nate Hedrick, and each week, my co-host David Bright and I explore stories from pharmacists all over the country who are achieving their real estate goals while maintaining a meaningful career in pharmacy. Whether you're a first-time investor or a seasoned pro, we're here to provide education and inspiration about the world of real estate. Please note, this podcast is intended for educational purposes only and should not be considered financial or investment advice. Hey, David, how's it going, sir? Hey, good, thanks. How you doing, man? I am good. I am uh, I am busy. This market is insane. I have been working more than I want to as a real estate agent recently, but that's okay. Helping my clients out. So it's just, it's just nuts. What about you guys? Yeah, we've got a property we're thinking about listing right now. We're just trying to figure out what to do in this market because you're right, it's it's different right now, right? Like it's really hard to get listings accepted. What what kind of stuff are you seeing right now? It's great for my listings, right? So I've got a listing actually coming up. Actually, it'll drop the day this podcast goes live, which is cool. Um, so that listing is nice because listings right now are, are a little bit easier than they normally are, right? Lots of people coming through, lots of buyers available. But with my buyer clients, it's been a ton of work. It's a lot of showings. It's a lot of putting in offers, a lot of those offers not being accepted. We're struggling with the buyers right now. Yeah. And I, I saw that there was something that went on the YFP real estate investing Facebook group about some strategies to get those offers accepted and all that. So if if you're not a part of that Facebook group yet, I'd encourage you to jump in there. And there's always discussion and learning that's going on there as well. Yeah. That's a great point. We actually... Uh... I had an offer accepted, luckily, uh, this this past weekend, and we had to do an escalation clause, an appraisal gap coverage, and we we took our inspections. We didn't waive our inspections, but we said our inspections would be informational only, which means that we can't ask for repairs. We can back out of the deal if we find something scary, but we can't go back to the seller and say, hey, we want you to fix all this stuff. So it's a very, very crazy market right now. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of strategy going on there. And I think unpacking that in the Facebook group where there's different people that you can bug for advice and ideas and it can be really helpful. Speaking of advice, David, how about our uh, our guests this week? We've got uh, episode three. We had uh, Blake and Zach back. They were on a, a previous YFP episode, episode 168. And so we brought them back on because they are uh, they're just blowing it up in the real estate world. And so we had to make sure we brought them on. They're really encouraging. We we had a great time talking to these guys. They're They're all about the networking. They're all about the partnerships. It just it was a really easy conversation. I think that uh, our audience is really going to like this one. Yeah, they had a, a fun story in there. Speaking of like the phone a friend asking for ideas where they literally just did text a mentor of theirs when they were just in a bind trying to figure out what to do. And the mentor gave them a fantastic idea that ended up being huge for them, turned the, the deal around and made it a huge success. So stay tuned for that story in the middle. That's that's kind of a fun one. Definitely. And, and if you want some practical tips, especially getting started, because I think even you know in this market in and really in any time when you're trying to get started get off the ground get that first property it's really hard to get practical you know what can i do next tips and they give some really great stuff at the end about that getting started about how to actually take those first steps down the road which is really cool yeah they had one other thing in there about doing the math for a real estate investment for a long term rental and how to make that simple and straightforward, how to how to get through that without the analysis paralysis. So even when we talked about some other fancier ideas and ways that some people do this, they just have some pretty straightforward numbers that make this just really simple to think through. And I think that's especially helpful for someone that's trying to get out of the gates. Yeah, yeah this is a great episode. So I hope you guys enjoy it and uh, we'll take you to the interview now. Hey, Blake, Zach, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it hey, going? How's it going? Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, glad to join you guys. Yeah, well, we had you back on the YFP main show back on episode 168. And uh, we just knew, you know, based on your story, based on what you guys have been doing, the growth we've seen from you guys, we, we, we just had to have you back. So we're really excited to have you here. Yeah, thanks, yeah. For, thanks for inviting us. Yeah, appreciate you coming back. Right. Always enjoy it. So for those that didn't hear episode 168 or haven't checked it out yet, can we start with your, your pharmacy story a little bit? I think, you know, one of our main loading dose questions here at the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast is to get the, the pharmacy story first, and then we'll dive into the real estate stuff next. So I have worked in pharmacy since I was 18. I'm 33 now. So pretty much my whole life I've been doing this thing. Went to pharmacy school at University of Arkansas, graduated in 2013, and I've done community pharmacy ever since. Currently, I work at a independent pharmacy in a town called Conway, which is north of Little Rock, about 30 minutes north. 
just your typical mom and pop pharmacy. Really enjoy it. Been doing it for a long time and hopefully I'm there for, for a lifetime. I love it. I love it. I, I grew up in the drugstore world too. And so I love hearing community pharmacy, that love for community pharmacy coming through. So that's awesome. Really enjoy it. Could you tell us a little bit about your why behind real estate, how you got started, why you're doing it and what you're doing now? So I had, uh, if you've listened to the original YFP podcast, I was on there with Joe Baker and one of the, mm-hmm. I don't even know what number of episode it was, but he taught a uh, financial pharmacy literacy class uh, during our third year. And I took that. And at the time I was just blowing money. You know, you would take out the max amount of loans and just buy whatever the heck you wanted. And uh, <laughs> I was a pro at that. So I had his class. And at the same time, I was dating a girl and she gave me a Dave Ramsey book. So between Dave Ramsey and Joe Baker is a match made in heaven. I came frugal and turn my head around. So uh, I graduated, had a lot of debt and so we started paying off debt pretty heavy, paid off my loans and my wife loans from nurse practitioner school in about three years. And just saw that uh, the amount of money I was picking back for retirement wasn't going to do a lick of good if I ever wanted to do anything before I was 65, or I guess technically 59 and a half. So I started reading some uh, books, started listening to Bigger Pockets and Zach and I met at church and it's been there ever since. My wife and I had been investing since 2014. Uh, we kind of moved around for a little while with my work. And then long story short, in 20, 2014, we started investing. And then by the time we met Blake, I think we had seven or eight properties. And Blake was like, man, I really want to do this. And he had this deal that was like 10, 10 units in a town east of here. And I was like, that sounds like a cool deal. And he had like a partner lined up. Anyways, and it fell through and he was like, dude, let's just, let's just get some properties. Like, let's just do something. And I was like, <laughs> all right. I was like, tell you what, I was like, why don't, if you find something, cause I'd, I'd invested with my dad and I'd invested with my wife. And so I'd kind of like already had, I, I was real weary of partnerships. And I was like, I don't really know about, I was like, but I mean, if you can bring a deal to the table, like, sure, you know, I'll partner with you and we'll, we'll go through it. And then later on, you know, we, we have one property together and then you and your wife can figure it out after that. We'll, we'll just, we'll just do one together. So we, uh, the first deal, uh, he found on Craigslist of all places. And it was like five units that we went to look at five properties went to look at and three of them were trash. I mean, completely just awful. It looked like an idiot had remodeled them, but they at least had some, some good pieces of them. So we ended up out of those five, we ended up buying two and remodeled them. And after like the first month, his wife was bought in, Kristen was bought in. She was like, all right, let's do this thing. So then we kind of all just kind of just kept going from there. We had a realtor that Blake was friends with that just kept bringing us deals. Bought probably six of that first year and then probably six or seven the next year. And then anyway, so we're, I think we have 25 units now together. That's incredible. I mean, like I said, your story just in the short amount of time that you guys have been doing this is just, it's explosive. And I think that's awesome. I, I think one of the things that the first thought that jumps to my mind before we get into any hard numbers is, how did you fund all of that? Right. You know, I think a lot of people say, well, I figured out this process of getting a deal. Deal finding is obviously difficult, but you've kind of solved that with a good real estate agent and and good Craigslist searching, it sounds like. But how does it, how do you fund some of those deals and and keep the, keep the train rolling? I'll speak to that first. Whenever we, my wife and I first started, we were putting 15 to 20% down every deal. Mm -hmm. So it was just super slow. It was like one a year, if that, you know, it was just like, we couldn't. And so after, or four, my banker, I was like, hey, how do people buy so many houses? Like I'm hearing these people buy. And so bigger pockets, they were talking about one time, like these rehab loans and Burr strategy, buy rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. And I was like, how do you do that though? And he was like, well, you got to buy something that's pretty crappy and then fix it up. And I'll loan like 85% of the value. And I was like, oh, and like, I'll basically be able to leave. Like I'll be able to get my money back out. He was, he was like, yeah, basically. He was like, if you do it right, but you got to do it right. So I was like, all right. So I, so we got one, my wife and I got one like that. And then we haven't, I don't think we bought a single ready to go house since then. That was back in 2016, I think. And so then when, so whenever we, me and Blake met, we had already kind of started doing that. Uh, and since we ha- I have a remodeling background and so, and that's what I do full time now is remodel houses. So we were like, all right, we got to find these really crappy houses and then, you know, we can get the, the deals to work out for us a little better. So you want to speak about how that the numbers work on that? Yeah, well, we started. You had you asked where we found them. We started buying them before all that COVID stuff, just through realtors. But mm-hmm. I don't know. 
Mm. If it's like where most other U.S. like it is in Arkansas, it, you cannot find anything on the MLS right now. So we've transitioned in the last year from just straight MLS. We've gone to uh, we've started sending out letters driving. I guess they call it driving for dollars. So we've started using a uh, an app called Deal Machine. So we'll send postcards. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a few lawyers that we know that they'll send us estate deals on. Mm-hmm. So we've gotten a few that that's way. Really so it's really just networking because right now anything that's on the MLS, I mean, for our model, this doesn't really work at all. So we've had to do a more hybrid off-market deal and do the work ourselves, be able to get in zero down like we want. Well, and Blake being a community pharmacist really helps because he's like, oh, yeah, I've got like 10 lawyers that come through. I'll just talk to them. And then because I'm from here, I'm from this the town we're in, they're like, Oh yeah, yeah. We know the Hendrixes, you know, and so then it's like we kind of just works really well together in that in that regard. So we end up the connections he meets through the pharmacy all just kind of end up getting us deals. <laughs> yeah. So the birth strategy for us is what really worked out. That was finding homes for us wasn't your typical just list it, move in, put a renter in. Ours were mm-hmm. the, the houses that were dilapidated that need roofs, need flooring, needed paint. Needed cabinets, just a thing that the normal person would walk in and walk right out. But what was nice for us, if you find these, you can buy them at a cheap enough price that the bank will give you an improvement on. And typically, if you buy it right off market or mm-hmm. back in the day off MLS, you could get it at a good enough price to get your improvements in the loan that the bank offered. So you'd buy the house, you'd do all your improvements, and then on the back end, you just rent it out and refinance your money. That strategy has worked real, for us, real good for yeah. us, but We've had to get off market stuff. Yeah, because that allows you to repeat that capital and just keep keep the train rolling, which is yeah, which is the whole yeah. goal, which is awesome. So that's that's great. And it, it, it's it's cool because you know, Zach, you mentioned you basically just went to the, the bank and you didn't have to know everything, right? You went to him and said, How do people do this? Like help here's what I want to do, help me get there. And like you said, with good networking, good communication, and just simply asking that question, you guys got to to where you are today. So that's that's incredible. I always, I always found that finding the home was the hard th- or the easy thing to do. And I could talk a, I could talk a horse did. I mean, that's finding stuff's fine for me. <laughs> but it, the hard part as a pharmacist is you just analyze every little detail. So I think when I first started back in 2017, reading about this, I looked at probably 15, 20 deals before Zach and I had even talked about it. And it took me a year and a half just to do it. So for, for me, I think finding the deal is the easy part. I think. It's capitalizing on that first step of buying the property. That's the hard yeah. part. Yeah, I think most people, I would agree with that because most people, pharmacists, not pharmacists, doesn't matter really who you are. Mm-hmm. You, you, you're, it's so risky. It seems so risky and it's, you overanalyze everything mm-hmm. before you get your first deal. And then after you get your first one, you're like, oh, that's not that big of a deal. No, that's a that's a great springboard because one of the things we wanted to spend some time on today is how do you analyze that deal? How do you know what is a deal? How do you know whether you should jump at this or whether you should hang back? So I know that that rings true in pharmacy where mathematical accuracy is a really big deal for patient care and and certainly can be a big deal with making sure that a deal works in real estate. So can you walk us through a little bit of what makes a deal a good deal? What are the kind of things that you look for that tips you off that I think this is one worth doing some deep math on? And then let's take a minute and do some of that math. I guess you want to start out maybe talking about some terminology you use just to break down how we analyze. And then I guess we can go from there. That'd be great. Yeah. Typically what we do is we're looking for a minimum of a hundred dollars profit at the end of the month on a deal. But describe the hundred dollars. So that sounds like terrible. Yeah, a hundred dollars sounds like <laughs> not not good at all. So basically what we're looking at is we're taking a deal. So say a house rents for a thousand dollars a month, we're gonna take ten percent off of that typically for property management. Okay. We do all of our own stuff in house for property management, but if something ever happens and we can't do that, you wanna be able to pass it over to a property manager. So automatically we take ten percent when we're running number numbers off the rent. And then we also like to take 10% for CapEx. CapEx is this short for capital expenditures, but basically that means as you own the home, you're going to have a roof go out. You're going to have a hot water heater go out. You're going to have an AC go out. So this is just built-in savings into your rent that you can sit back and just be able to pay for that stuff down the road. So that's 10% for CapEx, 10% for property management. And then we always like to throw in this couple percentage points in there for vacancy. Depending on where you're at, I mean, that can vary. 
In Conway, there's hardly any, so we usually run about 3% vacancy. Sometimes we'll run 5% if it's a duplex, but majority of the houses I run, it's around 3%. So what we'll do is we'll take that, that $1,000 rent, take 23, 25% off of it. So that 25% off of that would be 750 bucks. And if that would pay for the uh, taxes, the insurance, and the mortgage, and we can still clear 100 bucks a month, it seems like a good deal to us. And, and part of that, the reason we chose that number, $100, is we said, hey, we want to be super aggressive. So some people were saying, people we met with was like, oh, man, I wouldn't even look at anything if it was running for, or if it was cash flowing less than $500, $400, or whatever. And we said, you know, we just aren't seeing that in our market that you can get that, you know, maybe sometimes. But I mean, we're buying some pretty good deals and they're not cash flowing. After we take out all we take out. And so we said, you know, at the, at the end of the day, we know that the houses we're buying we're going to get the four benefits of real estate, which is we're going to get a little bit of cash flow. We're going to get appreciation. We're going to get the tax benefits and we're going to have the, somebody else paying down the mortgage. So the loan pay down. So we said, you know, a hundred bucks doesn't sound like a lot, but whenever you plug all those other numbers in the loan pay down, the appreciation, the tax benefits is astronomically higher than a hundred dollars. And so, and we've seen, and we'll talk about it later, but we've seen that just holding onto a house for a few years, with the loan pay down alone and a little bit of appreciation with the benefits, you can but then turn it around and buy a different house for way more cash flow, you know, whatever. So, so while the hundred dollars might not sound like a lot to a lot of the listeners, the other benefits of real estate exist within that. And you can, you can take those numbers too. If you were just a single pharmacist with one or two homes, I mean, that same model, if you're buying a turnkey property, it rents for a thousand a month and say you're, you know, the taxes and insurance and the payment on it's only like six fifty a month. Literally you're clearing three fifty if you're if you're doing that yourself. So that's four grand a year and this money coming your way. So mm-hmm. if you look at it that way, I mean it's already done. You know, every ten years you might have a five thousand dollar roof. I mean you might just cash flow that yourself. So even that for us, I think we could take that and apply that just to a single individual, sure. buying them for just a couple properties too. Yeah, I really like that. What I what I especially like is that you guys came up with a plan. And found deals that fit fit that plan, right? Instead of going out there and just looking at every single house, trying to run numbers across the board, trying to work in 16 different areas, like that's overwhelming. And I think it's that's why a lot of analysis paralysis occurs is because people get lost in these numbers. But what you guys did is you said, we need a hundred bucks a month. And ideally it's going to be in a property that we can rehab or like you had a plan right from the beginning. And then you went and found deals that fit that model, which, which I think is awesome. The problem we had in the beginning, we didn't even use this model. We used the what bigger pockets calls a one percent rule. So if you buy something for a hundred thousand dollars, you want a thousand dollars a month. But the factor that it leaves out is interest rates. Mm-hmm. So when we were borrowing at the time, interest rates were like six and three quarters, sometimes seven percent. Well, right now a one percent rate uh, rule, sure you can get that on almost anything, and you're going to cash flow really good. But I mean, a lot of times, depending on the market you're in, the interest rate is not going to fluctuate with the rent. So you've got to have a good, a good filter taken to play that interest rate. So that's why that number, because your payment is always going to fluctuate with the interest rate. So that worked for our model really well. And I agree. I, uh, I have trouble with the 1% rule in certain areas that I look in because the taxes are very high and that totally messes up the 1% rule, right? The rents actually are much higher, and, but, but if the taxes are really high, then it can mess up that too as well. So yeah, it's a good point. And so I guess that, you know, one of the things I do want to mention that you guys talked about is you talked about getting that tax and insurance information, really peeling this back for a second for some of our listeners, you know, how do you go out and get that information from taxes to what's the insurance going to cost? Like, is that all on Zillow? How do, how do I know that going into a deal? Yeah. So we go on the, in our county, it's all public. So the, for taxes, so you go to the county assessor's website and just type in the address. So that's how we get property taxes. And then we, we inflate it a little bit because usually it's a homeowner uh, and they're getting like a homestead tax credit or whatever. So it's a little bit lower for them. So we'll just inflate it a little bit. If it's already an investment property, then we just use that same number. And then for insurance, what we did starting out, well, starting out, I just threw a number off the hip, said, hey, my homeowner's insurance is this much. My house at the time was about the same size. So it was kind of like, yeah, it's the same price range. So I was like, that's probably going to be in this range. And then we got a really good relationship with an insurance agent. Just started texting them. Hey, you know, can you just run quick numbers on this? You know, you know all of our parameters, you know, for insurance. Uh, we want the best coverage, all this stuff. What's it going to be, you know? And so once we kind of got in the swing of how they worked, we kind of, we were able to 
throw in numbers a lot easier. Now our insurance is all. It's all we're on a corporate line. Yeah, now. it's all the same now. I think the best benefit for, for us, uh, I'm probably going to get kicked from this from some of my friends, but we didn't go with your your captured agencies. I'm not going to name them, but you know, you know who they are. We went with the independent broker because you get locked into these single line insurance agencies. I mean, you get one price. And so we, we've been with our insurance agent and he can shop across probably 20 different agencies and get you a whole lot better price. Is it just this? We just add a property and it's just the same. Yeah. Now we're on a, now we're on a one corporate line. So all of our stuff's pretty inexpensive because it's on a high, how deductible, but before that, yeah. he would shop it across like five different insurance companies for us. Yeah. And he would get quotes back in a day. But that was the biggest thing that we decided is not going with the, I guess they call them captured agents. And I'm going to get kicked from some friends <laughs> for saying this. So, but anyways, that saved us a lot of money in the long run. Yeah, a lot of your customers probably. Yeah, probably a lot of my customers. So, anyways, that, that was the biggest benefit for us. So, plug out to the independent agents out there. You also mentioned uh, the, the CapEx in there and, and, you guys are in a very different market than than I am up here in Michigan. It's not super common for rental units up here to have air conditioning, and I'm assuming where you're at, that's a must. So, yeah, you know, I think that there's probably some market differences, but but how do you how do you figure out like is that 10 percent always a good number, or is it like a big four bedroom house can be different than a little two bedroom, or or like how do you how do you put all that together? We use the same number. We we use the same 10 percent. You know, probably should make some adjustments, but usually, not every time, but usually when we buy a house, we automatically put a new roof on. We automatically switch out the HVAC and water heater. And usually, well, nowadays we're doing sewer lines because we've had such bad issues with sewer lines going going bad. And whenever you have a renter in a house on a crawl space, a pier and beam house, and your sewer line busts underneath the house, and they smell that stuff for so long, you know, it's like, all right, we're just going to start changing out sewer lines uh, <laughs> before anybody moves in. So we had like two, two go out in 2019. We were like, yeah, we're never doing never this again. again. Uh, <laughs> so, so we, we kind of, we're trying to make them, you know, we buy a lot of old houses. And so can you cover everything ahead of time? You probably can spend a fortune, but we try to get as much as we can ahead of time then. So the ten percent we use, it's a pretty good number, but probably need to adjust it sometimes. If you know, you go from a thousand square foot house to a seventeen hundred square foot house, that roof's going to be yeah. drastically more expensive. You know, and the HVAC is going to be a couple thousand dollars more. So yeah, but your rents fluctuate. With yeah, the, that's what, with a size. So I mean, four bedroom house versus three bedroom, twelve hundred versus fifteen hundred. So, so your that's, percentage just kind of three hundred dollars. You know, three hundred dollars a month. That's thirty six hundred dollars a year. You know, if you. Yeah. If you're only having to buy stuff every five or ten years, that's an extra fifteen thousand bucks in captured rent. So sure. I, I, that percentage kind of goes across. Yeah, goes across that. So yeah, kinda, you're right. Kind of takes care of it all. I like that, and I like the tip about the new roof and the the new mechanicals. Any other tips that you guys have of things that you do to make your your rentals low maintenance over time? Hey, you've got the yeah. remodeler here. That's not my expertise. <laughs> So I've, and I've taken a lot of advice. We have a friend that's 15, 20 years older than us, I guess. And he's been in the business way longer than us. So we've taken a lot of of, uh, advice from him. And he was the one that was like, man, before you put a tenant in there, roof, HVAC, water. He he was even saying like, man, if my roof's only five, if it's just five years old, I'll just go ahead and replace it. I buy it. Wow. Just to have it brand new right whenever he gets it. And which has, we, we don't do that. If it's five years old, we're like, sweet, we got one that's new. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we do, you know, like with flooring, we use vinyl plank. Uh, we've had a couple with hardwoods that are already have hardwoods or there's hardwoods under carpet. And so um, we have somebody either refinish the floors. We had, we had, uh, we bought two properties from this guy that is a landlord. And um, anyways, he painted the hardwoods. And so we were like, why would you paint hardwoods? And then Ugh. we realized when we, we were remodeling the house, I went and I had a, I had a college kid, you know, I hired and said, Hey, just roll the paint on, you know, just go ahead and touch it up. Cost me like <laughs> $75 to do the floors. It's like, oh, God. all right, this is why the dude painted the hardwoods. Like that's so easy. <laughs> if we just do that every time somebody moves out, you know? So I'm not, I would not recommend that because gosh, you're taking some beautiful hardwood floors and that really hurts me to paint hardwood <laughs> floors. But 
since it was already done, that was an awesome like tip from another landlord that we got. Another tip too, when you paint floors, don't do it. That cost you did. We found out he brushed them. He didn't roll them. Oh yeah. He spent eight hours like meticulously <laughs> brushing. Well, that, was my, that was my so, that was my fault. Yeah. I I gave him a paintbrush, and I was like, I meant to tell him, hey, if you go get a roller, and I just never did. So he just thought, oh, just brush all of this. I mean, it was like <laughs> twelve hundred square feet of floors that he hand painted with a paintbrush anyways he's a great friend love the dude glad he did <laughs> yeah, we're all still friends after that we bought, so. him, we bought him some beer or something yeah. i'm sure i'm just picturing as an agent trying to explain to a protective potential buyer like i i'm not sure why they painted these hardwood fl- i bet you could fix that like i that conversation would go terribly i can tell you <laughs> yeah. oh yeah, yeah it, it blew me away when i first saw him and i was like Oh, 75 bucks. Yeah, 75 bucks. I'll tell you one thing that a lot of people uh, skimp out on is countertops. A lot of people go with your laminate or Formica, post form, whatever you want to call it, plastic countertops. And we've had, we've had so many issues with some of those old Formica countertops where, because tenants don't care, like, so they'll just put hot stuff on them and then it bubbles up and has issues. You know, granite is in our market. We can get it for fairly cheap. Depends on who you use, I guess. But you can get it for fairly cheap, and you can get some cheaper ends of the granite market. And you know, we can replace in a in a house. We can do it for a couple thousand bucks. Granite countertops. I mean, yeah, you got to seal them. There's still things you got to take care of on granite countertops. But tenants are much better with granite than they are with plastic. I mean, you can put hot stuff on granite. You can. I mean, spill stuff and it's not, you know, not the end of the world. If there's an extra stain, granite has so many specks in it already. It's so, it's kind of already busy. And so if they may, if they have a stain on it, that's not a big deal, you know? And so you just seal them at, after every tenancy, you know, if you, if, as long as your tenants are moving out every couple of years, you know, and now if somebody stays there for 10 years, you probably want to go in there and reseal them. But that's kind of, that's one of our, probably one of the best things we started doing was just putting granite in yeah. every rental property. And also you, you can command a higher rent because you have granite countertops in your in your room. I was going to ask if that helped with rent or if it helped with your uh, your refi numbers too. Yeah, yeah, I think for refi it helps out a ton. Mm-hmm. People love that, especially when the the appraisers running comps. It just gives you better better markets to, or better properties to look at and gives you a better price point. Exactly, because a lot of the flippers in town are using high end yeah. stone, you know, countertops, and so if we kind of if we're kind of in that. I mean, they're they're commanding a way higher appraisal value yeah. with some of the flips they do because they just put really high end stuff in them. Sure. So you know, if we have stone and they have stone, then you know, there's a comparable. Yeah, same thing with the vinyl plank too. You can pull up a five thousand square foot house and you're going to see listed as a plus in their luxury vinyl plank. So <laughs> that and granite just makes your house look just as nice as those. And the wear layer makes a huge difference for vinyl plank too, which I don't want to get too nitty gritty here, but because I can nerd out on the vinyl plank, but. <laughs> The thicker, you know, if you get it from like Lowe's or Home Depot, you're going to get a really thin wear layer. And so what we found is we have a uh, like a lumber company in town. It's just a local lumber company. And they have some really high quality vinyl plank for cheap. And But the wear layer is a lot thicker. And so it doesn't scratch quite as easy. I mean, it, it might scratch, but it kind of can buff out a lot easier. It takes a lot longer to get through. You kind of have to look at all that because you can go to Lowe's and buy the same buy the same price per square foot vinyl plank and it's going to be a lot worse quality and so we were at one point we were spending a lot of money on vinyl plank at Lowe's and I was like I called my uh, distributor I was like how much is this you know that y'all have and he was like oh it's like two bucks a foot gosh I'm spending two fifty or three dollars at Lowe's for a worse product so I'm sure Lowe's has some really good products as well but I ended up finding one that, that worked better for us we're not doing good for y'all's plugs there we've already Already manhandled Lowe's and Home Depot and all and, the, and all the captured, all, agents, all the captured the agents. Yeah. Hope y'all blurt these out. We're not helping you guys out much. Just beep. Just yeah. beep it out. Yeah. Like a cuss word. Yeah. I'm going to have a long line at the pharmacy in about three weeks. Guaranteed you. Right, right. No, I see David f- taking notes over there because the, the, our, our next flip, we're going to be looking at this uh, alternative distributors for our vinyl plane flooring. So I think that's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Well, what I love about it is you're building it just a recipe. You're you're just building the cookbook for like, this is how we do it. We do it this way every time. It's just super simple. I don't have to think about it. I just build the plan. I execute the plan. There's there's a real beauty there in the simplicity of what you guys are building. Absolutely. It's pretty boring. We go, I mean, even down to the same paint color. I mean, we just have get like five gallon buckets of paint. So carry this to this house, same color yeah, floor. Just kind of moves around. Same everything. So 
it's just fix the bones and make everything look the same. But light fixtures are all the same, pretty much. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes our wives get involved and want to pick out some nice looking yeah. light fixtures, but usually we just get the same ones. <laughs> Well, I want to take a step back and, and I want to uh, I want to run some numbers. I think we've been talking a lot about these great tips and I think that's just it's an awesome awesome view into what you guys do and the experience that you have. But for our our listeners that are thinking, well, okay, how do I get my first deal? I want to run some numbers and, and walk through what that looks like so we can we can feel good about it. So do you have a deal that we can walk through just some of the the hard math on? Yeah, I've got a couple yeah. of deals. I got one I think that'll really be easy to walk through. So lay it out for me. What was the uh, purchase price? What was the projected rent? You know, did you do rehab on it? Things like that. Yeah, I'll go through the numbers and kind of let Zach talk about the remodel because this was a, a bigger remodel, but mm-hmm. it uh, worked out pretty good. So we bought this house for $51,000. If you're in California, that would be a probably a quarter of a lot out there. <laughs> right. This is actually a three-bedroom, two-bath house here. It was in pretty rough shape. The repair budget on it was 54000 So oh, wow. the repairs on the house is actually more than the purchase. So our total loan on that was right around a hundred thousand, and we'd appraised out at a hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, right there, we had fifty thousand for, or forced equity. It'll rent out at about twelve hundred a month. So I think the payment on that will come out to be like six fifty, seven hundred bucks at a hundred thousand dollars, or maybe six fifty with everything included. So, but our net on that would be a couple hundred bucks. It was actually a pretty good deal. Yeah, it's a great deal. It breaks the one percent rule that we talked about earlier not being as important. <laughs> oh yeah, way breaks the one percent rule. Yeah, <laughs> it crushes it. Finding that one was interesting too because I'll, and I'll talk a little bit. That kind of goes into the repairs and analyzing the deal when we first looked at it. So it's actually right next to the first house we bought, and so we had been beside this house for two years now, and nobody was there. So I was like, man, this house is vacant. Another year goes by, the house is vacant. So at that point, I just started researching. So I called the guy that owns it, and he was like. Yeah, I actually owner financed it to so and so. So here's his number. So I was like, okay. I was like, well, there's nobody in there. So I don't know how he's, you know, he's just paying you, I guess. Yeah. So I called him. This is probably 2019. I called him. Yeah. Yeah. And and he goes, he was like, now nah, I'm remodeling it. He he owned a foundation company and he was remodeling. It. And I was like, sweet. Like, that's awesome. You know, just holler at me if you need anything, you know, or whatever, if you ever want to sell. So another year, I think another year goes by, maybe six months, eight months, somewhere in there. And still vacant. Nobody's worked on it. I live around the corner from it. So I knew like nobody's there. And so I finally called him again and he's like, yeah, okay, I'll consider selling it. So I met with him and I got to the house and he's like, yeah, my wife's actually pretty, like pretty upset about that. I still have this house and we haven't gotten it rented out yet. Like we, we got to get rid of this thing. Like she's pretty upset. So I was like, Hey, you know, I can take care of that. No problem. So started looking at, he's like, man, I've done all the foundation work on it. So basically brand new foundation. I mean, he owns a really high end foundation company in town. He, uh, his cousin owned an electrical electric company. So he put all new wiring in it. He had a new panel box, uh, everything. Another cousin of his or friend, somebody owned a, a HVAC company. So they put a brand new HVAC service in it. Like <laughs> I think it was about five years ago. Everything was in. He furred down the ceiling to get new ducts run in to the house. So was, like, everything was super, super updated, but it just wasn't finished. So like we walked in, it was, it was a war zone. I mean, there's like holes in the subfloors where they'd been doing some plumbing work and it's, and like there's no sheetrock on the ceiling or walls. The windows are busted out because like, they, I guess they had some vandalism since it had been vacant for a couple of years. So, uh, so we were like, man, what are you trying to get out of this thing? He was like, all I want is what I have in it. So we were like, okay, sure. Wow. So he told us 50, 51000 And so we just said, sure, you know, we'll, we'll go for it. We'd looked at enough deals, I guess, at that point where we just kind of ran some some pretty quick numbers on what it would cost to fix it up. And we, we ended up doing a little bit more than what we planned on. I wasn't going to do all new cabinets. And then it was just turning into a beautiful house. And so I said, man, we're just going to do new cabinets. So, uh, and we had some rot underneath the cabinets. So we were going to have to pull them anyway. So we ended up doing new cabinets. That added a probably about three grand. The guys that work for us built them, so it wasn't wasn't too bad of a deal. And the value adding that too, I don't, I don't know if yeah. you mentioned it, it was a th- it, it was a three one three oh, bedroom yeah. one bath. Yeah. So in our market, three details. bedroom one bath, you're renting probably a thousand thousand bucks three yeah. to twelve hundred dollars. And so, so we have if you follow the one percent rule, you know one percent on two hundred bucks is twenty grand. And to add that bathroom is only ten thousand dollars. Yeah, so, I, forgot, I forgot to mention that. We yeah, that was a good that was a good investment for us on that end to add that. 
did you did you guys want to like break down using that the percentages on that deal like start with the rent and talk about the insurance and all that yeah sure if you don't mind i think I think that would give us just the the, the clarity of, of where all these numbers are going. And, and you can see how you get to that bottom line number of here's how much we're actually putting back in our pocket every month. Every deal that we get, we get an in-house balloon note. I'm sure uh, that'll be talked about on the show sometimes. But basically, our notes are five years long and they the bank amortizes them over 20 years. So if you take your typical home mortgage, they're amortized over 30. The notes that we're getting are amortized over 20. If you're looking at our payment on the house, the insurance on this house was going to be roughly 650 bucks, and the taxes are about 650 bucks. And so if you ran those in, I always use Zillow calculator, plug in Zillow for you guys. They've got a really good calculator. If you plug that in there, the house with the insurance and taxes is about $700 a month. That's our payment on the house. And so if you take the 1% rule and take the 20% off of that or the 25% off of that, so twelve hundred times 0. 0.75 be eight hundred and forty dollars, and then you take the payment off. Seven thirty. Yeah, seven thirty. So net one hundred ten bucks. This one we do in house uh, property management, and so right now we can run it at eighty percent, eighty two percent. So on our end, it's netting almost a couple a couple of hundred dollars. But worst case scenario, we can hand this deal over to a uh, property manager and still net our hundred dollars a month. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's awesome. I really appreciate you guys walking through that. Yeah, you bet. Hey, you're welcome. So that kind of leads me to the next question of, this is definitely sounds like a success story. You were able to get this thing, have a lot of built-in equity. You were able to get the loan, pull your money back out. At the end of the day, it's producing cash flow for you. It really sounds like a, a winner of a deal. Have you ever had something that wasn't so much of a winner? And what do you do when you get something like that? We had We bought this house that we thought was going to be the Best house in town. I don't know if y'all have ever been there. You see this and like, this is going to be a great deal. It set two two houses back off one of the busiest streets in Conway. Right in front of it was like the park where all moms go hang out with their kids. Like, I mean, it was picturesque. It's like Gilmore Girls. <laughs> just got a brand new. You were there. Just yeah. had a brand new. The city just put a new splash pad in. Which I don't know if yeah. y'all cities have those, mm-hmm. but in the summertime, these kids go. I mean, it's this massive splash pad where the kids can just run around and play. So we were like, man, brand new, like, State-of-the-art tennis courts just built across the street. We're like, this thing is going to be incredible. So we bought it and got our, actually a pretty good deal on it. I think we were all in on the house at about $100,000. And it got to rent it. We listed it for, I think, $1,150, $1,100. Two weeks went by and we didn't hear anything. Dropped it down to about $1,000. Two weeks went by, still didn't hear anything. We ended up renting it out at 950 bucks. If you were to take that same house and move it probably two streets over off the busy street, it would have gone for $1,200 in a day. Wow. No no kidding. We held on to that house for two years. Two years, yeah. What kind of got us out of that house was we had uh, a guy that I worked for a long time ago. It's a pharmacist. I was a pharmacy tech at the time uh, back in college. And then his partner was a pharmacy tech that I worked with. So they actually contacted Blake. Blake worked for his son-in-law. So it was another one of those kind of mutual mutual contacts we had. And he called Blake and he was like, hey, I heard you've been buying some rental properties or, you know, whatever. He's like, would you be interested in uh, one of ours? And so he said, yeah, absolutely. So it was two duplexes and they're one block off of the main university street. So Donaghy Avenue in Conway, like the College of Business is right here by U- University of Central Arkansas. And then so it's one block off of that. So it was like, Really good location. We already have a couple in that kind of area. So we know they rent good. But I was like, yeah, sure, we can look at them. And we looked at them. And it was just like the numbers just didn't quite work with what they were wanting. And their need to sell, had, there were some health issues. And so we really didn't want to be jerks and like talk them down a whole lot. Like we wanted to be able to have a win win situation. We were in uh, Lake Tanicomo or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I had a weekend. I had analysis paralysis like we all get for a minute. And I was like, this can't work without us putting thirty thousand dollars cash in, <laughs> which I did not want to do at all. Yeah. That, and so we we were at in Branson, and I sat yeah. down. And I was like, "What if we sell a house? What if we yeah. just sell a house and use that as our profit to do the remodel?" Actually, one of the, our friends that uh, that I was talking about earlier that has given us a ton of really good advice. You know, he had, he's a lot further in the journey, so he's his numbers look a lot different than ours. He's able to put a lot of money in to properties. Uh, and so he has that fortune. 
So we text, we just texted him like, hey, you know, we're thinking about buying a couple duplexes. We really need to offload a property. You know, would you be interested in this one? We need to, we need to sell it for like one twenty five or something like that. Yeah, one twenty five was owed ninety on it. Yeah, yeah, we owed ninety at the time. So he goes, yeah, sure, <laughs> okay. Yeah. How do you want to do this? You know, and he was like, I mean, I trust you guys, so yeah. just write it up and I'll look That's at it after we purchase it. <laughs> so we're so we're sitting there with a uh, with thirty five thousand dollars in profit, and uh, we didn't want to pay taxes, and so we did something called a ten thirty one exchange, which. You just buy a like kind property at a higher value and the government lets you offset those taxes just by rolling it into the property. Mm-hmm. So we rolled that money into these duplexes and used that money as the uh, rehab yeah. budget for the house. And so we turned like negative 25 bucks into almost $700 profit. Wow. I guess a dud into a stud, if you could say. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a, such a great example of how you took something that, you know, it wasn't crippling you guys but it wasn't helping and you totally turn that around into something that is it's killing it that's awesome and we i mean we barely did anything to those duplex i mean we did floors and paint yeah. and light fixtures i think i think across like four total units we probably spent twenty thousand dollars or something something like that and then, and got great cash flow at the end too oh yeah yeah, yeah extreme cash flow i mean if you had, if you add back in the property management and all that i mean if somebody was doing this themselves it would pay them thirteen fourteen hundred dollars a month probably well, guys, I feel like I could listen to uh, your stories all night, but I want to make sure we uh, we get to the uh, the final infusion questions here and, and and wrap things up a bit. So we ask these same three questions of all of our guests, and we want to ask them to you guys tonight and see what we get. So the first one is, what is one tangible strategy that you can use to make your investing work with your pharmacy career so it doesn't distract you from your career in pharmacy? So I guess, Blake, this is a little more specific to you. Yeah, it really affects my pharmacy career. Big time. <laughs> I, I really struggle to keep yeah. pharmacy on the front of my mind just because I'm just so focused on real estate. Our partnership works out great, but I've got a few friends that are wanting to get into real estate. And I think the biggest thing before you start tackling properties as a, as a pharmacist or define your goals, are you going to inject cash in a deal? Or are you going to go where it's turnkey? If it's turnkey, then just hand it over to a property manager. So you need a property manager. Just to take that over and let them do it all for you. That becomes a passive property. If not, you need to have a contractor that you can trust and that property manager on the back end. I believe you can do most all property management after hours. But most pharmacists have odd hours. You know, if you work for a chain, you might work in the morning sometime and work in the evening sometimes. So I think for most pharmacists, they're going to be more of the property manager route. They might try it to do it themselves, but most people will probably end up using a property manager. So. I think the biggest thing is getting those getting those set up. That way, uh, number one, you can take care of your patients during the day. Uh, you know, we have a high stress job, especially with COVID shots, and this is stress of the low reimbursements going on. So the last thing you need is mm-hmm. to have to worry about anything like that during the day. This number two, just making sure that you can take care of your employer. Number one, that, that's the second most important thing. No, I I love that. And I love that you guys talk about that value of the partnership and you spoke about the value of having a mentor in there too, that you can turn to for advice and just, yeah, that, I think that's, that's huge. So without the mentor or the partner being to answer this next one, what's the one resource that has been the most helpful to you in your real estate journey for both y'all, whether that's a book, a podcast, a author, a website? I would say the turning point in my investing career was bigger pockets. So I really have to give them a lot of credit. And I think my wife and I were training for a half marathon back in 2015 or 2016. And we listened during the training. I think we listened to probably like 50 podcasts or something like that. <laughs> That's awesome. Just like we would, we'd be pushing our one-year-old in a stroller running with like radio blasting of bigger pockets. Like everybody we passed was like, what are y'all listening to? I know everybody's listening to rock music and we're listening to Brandon Turner on a podcast. So that was the biggest thing for me was whenever listening to those first hundred podcasts, 150 podcasts or whatever, that's whenever I learned, Oh wow. Like my strategy is so small. I mean, when I first started, I was 23 or 24, 23, I guess. And my goal at that point was to have five properties by the time I turned 30. And so, and I just, I turned thir- I, I will turn 30 this year and we have like total, we have about 35 properties. So it's like my goals went from little bitty tiny goals to exponential goals whenever we found bigger pockets. Cause I, I mean, I, 
there's no way I would have found $20,000 every couple months to put down payments in, yeah. you know, and that's what bigger pockets was big on was teaching you kind of the strategy of how to, how to do it. And then the forums obviously were, were very helpful. So that was, that was a really big resource for me. So we, we nerded out this past February, we went skiing in Colorado. And so that's where the bigger pockets headquarters are. So we had to make a little surprise trip over there. We got to meet Scott Trench, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So, that's awesome. Anyways, <laughs> that was fun. So I, bigger pockets for me was probably the same thing. All the books that they offer and this, the guests and stuff that they have, really anything that you need to start and just get a hold of is in that. For, for us starting out and even still now, if there's something we need to know, you can go on the forums and find anything. Mm-hmm. That was a huge resource and still is for us. Well, I'm used to you had some really like, you had gurus, you know, that were, you know, the mm-hmm. high end, they have huge apartment complexes and you can buy into them and all that. So that was kind of the only resource for a long time, I guess. And so whenever you hear normal people on a podcast, I mean, just like kind of like me and Blake, like you hear normal people that are investors and they're killing it. And you're like, oh, dang, I could do that too. Yeah. You know? And so it's a lot more personal. <laughs> so I think that's, I mean, that's, that's probably part of the whole podcast, like reality that we live in now is like, we can, you can have these conversations, which is incredible. Like YFP, like, we can have these conversations and now more pharmacists can go, oh, I want to be like Blake. I want to be like David. You know, like you can actually relate to people a lot more instead of going, that dude, he owns like $10 million in real estate. I can never be him. I think that's, that's helpful. Yeah, that, that's big for us is, is finding something that is attainable, right? Not just talking to those people, like you said, that have, you know, $10 million portfolios and, and 100, 100 units here and there. It's like, that's that doesn't feel like I know the next step, right? But if you talk to somebody who's done it, you know, for three years and and scaled up like this, you know, that's a great person to model after. And that's kind of exactly what we're going for is that same field. So then I guess we'll we'll wrap things up with the very last question, guys. What is one piece of advice you would give to a a pharmacist or anyone, Zach, I don't want to single you out here, but anyone uh, (laughs) contemplating a start in real estate investing? Man, I would tell pharmacists, number one, have your debts paid down. You don't need $100,000 $100,000 in student loans trying to buy a property. Dave Ramsey. Yeah, Dave Ramsey. <laughs> go for the Dave Ramsey. Or Joe Baker's book. He's YFP. So you got to give Joe go. a, got to give Joe a plug. Baker's Dirty Dozen. It'll lead into that, that pharmacists have cash flow coming through. Your job creates lots of cash flow. So where most people are trying to sit down and figure out a budget of how to have that saving, built-in savings, the cash flow, a hot water heater or an AC, they just, you've got that. So once you've got that done, just start doing it. That was my biggest thing was trying to figure out all the what ifs. But most small things in a house, you can cash flow in a month. Just get started, but have the debt paid down. I'll add on to that. The only thing I'll remember from college, which is terrible, but the only thing I actually remember from college that I can like take away every day is I had this professor, I'll shout him out, Dr. Bradley. He was this older guy, had a ton of business experience. He'd walk into class and he'd, you know, he'd make his pants up and you know, he, and he was doing a small business class with us and I was trying to start some weird business. I had a business plan that it wasn't going to work. Anyways, he comes up to me and he's like, so what's keeping you from doing it? And I was like, well, I mean, my business plan kind of sucks. You know, like I had like a lot of excuses. I like the money. Like, I just don't know how I'm going to find the money and all this stuff. And he, goes, he, he grits his teeth and he goes, listen, son, sometimes you just got to pull the trigger. And I was like, Dang, like, you're right. I should. And that business didn't go anywhere. But when I got it started in real estate, you know, it was the same thing. It was like, you just got to pull the trigger. You just got to do it. And we have, we have several friends that are like about to start real estate investing, all that. And I'm like, look, like you just do it. Just get started. If you can get one house, even if it's, I mean, I know this is probably the worst advice, but even if it's not a great deal, you still have a property you're going to learn. So Say you lose $100 a month, that's 1200 bucks a year. Sounds like a pretty cheap education. And then you sell it in five, 10 years, you end up probably looking like a genius unless you bought in you know, Detroit in 2008. But most likely it's going to appreciate over time. You know? And so it's okay. Don't, don't get bogged down in, oh, I have to get this, I have to get this. Get a property. And then eventually it'll kind of work itself out and you'll learn it. And be able to replicate that and realize this is what I did wrong. I'm not going to do that again. These are the deals I want to find. This is the banker I'm going to use. This is the contractor I'm going to use. And then you start getting a system figured out. And then you can actually start buying really good deals and and creating a really good portfolio. But you have to get that one or else you're just going to be floundering, being a wannabe real estate investor. And then you're going to wake up and you're 45 or 50 or 60 or 70. And you're going to go, man, I wish I would have gotten in real estate. 
and I never did. So I think that's uh, that was probably the best thing that that professor ever taught me. I love it. I think it's that's super solid advice from both you guys. You, you guys are obviously you know wealths of knowledge, and I really appreciate you guys being on the show today. It's just been uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to both of you. Hey, thank well, you. Thanks so it. much thank for having us on. Yeah, yeah, thank you guys. Even if I am an imposter, not a pharmacist. That hey, that's all right. Like I said, we you're the first uh, non pharmacist on the show, which is perfect. So actually, well, Tim Baker yes. too. So I'll I guess it. yeah, you, <laughs> you can compete uh, with him for that. <laughs> so yeah, so I guess the, we'll just wrap things up, guys. With uh, where, where can people find you if they want to reach out and you know hit you guys up? My pharmacy emails be easy to uh, do. So Blake at SmithFamilyPharmacy dot com. I don't have any social media. Neither does Zach. So. <laughs> We're boring people. So <laughs> yeah, Blake at smithfamilypharmacy.com. And I'd be glad to answer any questions or connect with anybody in that way. Our website for our, uh, our remodeling company is hendrixremodel.com. So I can, I can send you the, the link to that. Yep. We'll put it in the show notes. That's perfect. Guys, really seriously appreciate it. I, uh, again, I'm sure we'll have you back at some point because you guys are just, you're, you're taking off and we want, we want to be along for the ride. So appreciate it. We'd be love yeah. to come back. Yeah. Thanks so much. All right. Have a good one. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you liked what you heard on today's episode, please leave us a review and subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. If you have a question, know someone who'd make a good guest for the show or want to connect with Nate and David, head on over to yfprealestate.com or join the growing YFP Real Estate Investing Facebook group. See you next time.